Ah, uh, let me see. There is a background. Okay. Right. Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we are doing the switch today and outwitting the devil uh, by Napoleon Hill. Delighted to have uh, Chase and Alex back. Chase, take it away. All right. Thanks, Rikant. Yeah, delighted to be back. Um, all right. This is week nine of our Outwitting the Devil series, picking right up where we left off. Uh, the way today is going to go, I'll give a quick recap of the book for anybody who has never read it before. And then we'll just launch right into this week's principle. We're going through a couple of principles of the book. Uh, we'll talk through the principle, have a discussion. You know, you can contribute. If you've got questions, you can always type them in the chat or just type an exclamation point. And then the next point where it's, you know, we're ready for audience participation. I can just call on you and you can use your own voice and be a, a part of this conversation in that way as well. Um, at the end, we'll do a quick exercise and then go into breakout rooms for sort of smaller group discussions. After the breakout rooms, we'll get back together, go through some takeaways. Um, it's a whole process, well rehearsed, and it works beautifully. I encourage everyone to stay for as much of it as you can. It will be engaging and awesome. So, Outwitting the Devil. It was written in 1938 by Napoleon Hill, who also authored Think and Grow Rich. Um, it was withheld from publication, though, because it was considered too controversial, too, uh, I like to use the term politically incorrect, because he was criticizing through this book institutions that actually had power over the way people live their lives, including Napoleon Hill and his wife. Um, and the book itself is presented as a conversation between Mr. Earthbound, Napoleon, and the devil himself. Um, and in this conversation, the devil is bound by whatever magical situation they're in to tell the truth and to be unable to lie to Mr. Earthbound. And so they discuss all of the ways that the devil induces people to do what they call drifting. And drifting is essentially not fulfilling your full potential. It's all the ways that the devil, in this case, keeps people from becoming who they could be through utilizing their natural desires, through uh, the, the forces of hypnotic rhythm and all of these things that they talk about in the book. And one, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, regardless of your interpretation of this particular conversation, you know, some people think it was actually a conversation with a, the real devil. Some people think that Napoleon Hill thought it was a conversation with the real devil. And obviously he it wasn't and that he was delusional. And some people think Napoleon Hill didn't mean this to be interpreted as a real conversation. He meant it in the metaphorical sense of this is a this is a vehicle for for conveying these important ideas about how to live a self-actualized life by sort of flipping the ways that people are induced to drifting and discovering your non-drifting self and moving into success and self-actualization through that doesn't matter what your interpretation of the book is these principles are amazing uh, however you take them and so uh, there's a list in the book of 10 principles, and I've added the overarching principle as an 11th. We're on principle number eight. So this week's principle, uh, my wording is insist upon getting exactly what you want with no substitutes. But the, the specific wording of this principle is this. When you pray, do not beg. Demand what you want and insist upon getting exactly that with no substitutes. One more time. When you pray, do not beg. Demand what you want and insist upon getting exactly that with no substitutes. So the question is, what does this mean? What, what is the point of this imperative? And to that, I will turn to my co-host, Alex, to uh, get your interpretation. All right. Um, thanks for the intro. Uh, so I think there's a few things. I think the first thing that stands out to me is uh, demand what you want and insist upon getting exactly that with no substitutes. What that really brings to mind for me is 
a habit I noticed in myself and a lot of people where goals start to uh, goals don't end up being reached because of a very slow slip. It didn't quite hit it. That's fine. But then the standard is slightly lowered for the next time. Hmm. So then next time you aim for it, you're aiming for the last time. And there's a certain amount of acceptance we have for not hitting the mark. And I think that's fine. But there's a trend that I think is important to be aware of is that like moving the goalposts, you know, downwards to mm -hmm. where it's, you're not really pushing yourself. So it's it just in, in the direction, even a slight change in that will make over uh, years of doing something is, is significant. So that's what, it, what rings um, important in that to me. Um, yeah. It's, it's the hypnotic rhythm of letting your expectations slip it. Yeah. So demanding exactly what you want, you know, just having that as an imperative forces you to sort of constantly refresh, well, what is it I actually want? And to um, rearticulate your standards. Yeah. Yeah. It very, very specifically, I mean, it fits perfectly with the wording drifting. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and I think the, de the word demand is interesting um, because I, I don't think it necessarily means I think there's a few ways you can interpret it, interpret it like demand. I have that as an imperative on yourself, you basically being able to create an, a more objective standard of something and, and really take the time to assess what you want from life with the other principles. And this to me is an imperative to stick to that. Yeah. Don't change. Yeah. Absolutely. The standard is the standard and that's what you're shooting for. Uh, and anything less is a substitute and you're settling. And, you know, I think it's always, of course, important to understand that things that you want out of life can change. Goals can change. You have to be adaptable. But what you don't have to do is allow the feelings of failure like we've talked about in previous uh, episodes or the, the discomfort of things like discipline and struggle, you, you don't have to allow those things to change what you want because it's too difficult to deal with, right? That, I think that's, that's really what this is all about. And there's, there's actually a, a paragraph that I want to read from the book or a page that I want to read from the book that talks about prayer specifically because uh, you know I, i'm i'm uh not a religious person um uh, and so for me to hear this imperative as when you pray do not beg my question is well what's the secular interpretation of that because i think prayer serves a very specific function regardless of what religious uh you know angle you take on it the, the religions all over the world have some form of prayer or um, introspection or, you know, whatever it, it is. And there's got to be some framing of that that makes sense outside of the language of prayer specifically. So, you know, I, first of all, that's a question to the audience. What does it mean, pray? Like, what would be the secular translation for prayer? Um, so while we think about that, and we'll come to the audience, I want to read this and talk about what I got from that. Okay. There's nothing. Oh, so uh, Mr. Earthbound asks the devil, you just said that definiteness of purpose is the only sort of prayer upon which one can rely. Now you say that all prayers bring results. What do you mean? And the devil answers, there's nothing inconsistent about it. The majority of people who pray go to prayer only after everything else fails them. Naturally, they go with their minds filled with fear that the prayers will not be answered. Well, those fears are realized. The person who goes to prayer with definiteness of purpose and faith in the attainment of that purpose puts into motion the laws of nature which transmute one's dominating desires into their physical equivalent. That is all there is to prayer. One form of prayer is negative and brings only negative results. One form of prayer uh, one form is positive and brings definite positive results. Could anything be more simple? 
People who whine and beg to God to assume responsibility for all their troubles and provide them with all the necess necessities and luxuries of life are too lazy to create what they want and translate it into existence through the power of their own minds. When you hear a person praying for something that he should procure through his own efforts, you may be sure you are listening to a drifter. Infinite intelligence favors only those who understand and adapt themselves to her laws. She makes no discrimination because of fine character or pleasing personality. These things help people negotiate their way through life more harmoniously with one another, but the source from which prayer is answered is not impressed by fine feathers. Nature's law is know what you want, adapt yourself to my laws, and you shall have it. So yeah, I, I'd like to hear your response to that. And at this point, if anybody in the audience wants to, to weigh in on the function of prayer or respond to that specific uh, passage, now's the time. To me, one of the, it, it seemed like he was getting at the, the, the begging part of it. Basically, don't just to reiterate what part of the passage says, don't ask or, or beg for anything that you could do yourself. Mm. Right? It's kind of the like God helps those who help themselves type attitude. It's, it's don't, it, if you understand nature's laws, like in, in where you know this equals this, if I put in this much thing, I will get this. Don't just change that equation to substituting prayer or wishing whatever it is for that equation be demand if you want that and you demand that of life you can't substitute like other things for that if that makes sense yeah joe yeah i mean one of the distinctions that i see between prayer and uh a secu more secular version of prayer is the idea of meditation and you're having a relationship with God versus a relationship with maybe nature. So I, I, that's how I see one of those distinctions. Um, as far as the potential effects of them, uh, you know, I think that there, you know, there are benefits to both in a way. Um, I really like the concept too, is that if you see God and everyone else, then I think that that's a very healthy way of, uh, of you know, meditating and actually, um, and, uh, and, you know, accepting, you know, not necessarily dogmatic religious beliefs, but as well as like, but just respecting the fact that uh, you're respecting nature and everyone else in that process. So that's how uh, I've come to think about um, that's the distinction I would make. It's maybe meditation and versus, you know, this idea of prayer and a personal relationship with God, but the, it's not personal. It's just like, I look at it as seeing God and everyone else. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Caitlin. Is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think I just uh, chatted, but uh, yes, when I was growing up until like, say, early 20s, I was doing more like Catholic, was raised Catholic. So of course, you have to pray, you know, you pray when the in the context of the religion. But as I get to explore my own mind and make my own determination, I don't know if I'm Catholic or not, you know, I explored, I'm, I consider myself more spiritual. So then I always tell my, you know, that I, I make wishes. So, you know, just the, you go out walking at night or something, just kind of get closer to the universe. It's just more like a ceremony or mood and just make the wishes. And I don't know if it's wishing or praying outside or going inside because after Jung, maybe it's all inside the self, you know? So I think it's kind of like the similar thing. It's come true, but I did have a question. Um, how do you reckon with disappointment? You know, for example, you say just no holds barred, ask full throttle. But I guess people just maybe stop short because they don't want to get disappointed. You know, um, is that how what you mean by if you understand nature's law, so you kind of know your limits in that? You know, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, the hard truth is that you get out of life what you put in, and to to 
hold yourself back because of disappointment or to, you know, to wallow in disappointment at not achieving an ideal. Like, I, I don't think that's very productive um, behavior in general. Disappointment's hard and it's easier said than done to just deal with it in, you know, the most productive way possible. But at the end of the day, I think that's also the, the maturest thing to do is to understand you will be disappointed at some point, especially if you demand high, uh, high standard from yourself and from life. And the best thing that you can do is learn from failure and move on. We, we, we actually did a whole episode on failure uh, specifically about how you can extract from defeat or failure the seed of equivalent advantage. I think that's the posture to take in the face of failure rather than, you know, well, disappointment or the, the sort of emotional side of, um, you know, reminding yourself that you failed. But that's, that's, a, that's a hard truth to swallow and not everybody will do that. And yeah. So right. you just ask okay. for the full, full thing and then whatever you get, disappointed or not, you just get that. Uh, in some sense, yeah, but it, it's it's also like you have to realize that you have the power to affect what you get out of life, and you know this this also goes to the stoic attitude as well. Of uh, there are things in life that you can control and things that you can't. For the things that you can control, you need to act with virtue. That's wisdom, courage. Uh, I'm blanking. Wisdom, courage. There are the four stoic virtues, uh, wisdom, courage, justice, and prudence. Uh, prudence. Prudence. That's it. Thank you. Uh, for the things that you can control, you act with those virtues for the things that you can't control. You act with equanimity. You understand that the things that are out of your control are out of your control. And uh, you know, that's how it goes. All right. Shrikant, sorry, you look like you're sorry, about to say just, something. just a correction. Uh, so it is prudence, temperance, courage, and what is the fourth one? Wisdom. Justice. 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 Yeah. That's Justice. it. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, next is Mike and then Ritesh. Mike, you're up. Okay. Um, uh, since we aren't supposed to talk about uh, really religion or politics, I'll say that uh, uh, the uh, there's this uh, uh, the the secret uh, the the secret of the universe of tell the universe what you want and uh, it'll pro it'll probably and you'll if you visualize it right that'll set the tone that synchronicity will work and you'll get it. And that's not inconsistent with Matthew 6, which is the run up to the service as uh, to the Sermon on the Mount, where um, uh, Matthew is trying to explain uh, how you should pray. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you're not supposed to say, uh, oh, there's that song, um, uh, God, God get me a Mercedes Benz, all my friends have Porsches and I must make amends. That's not the way to pray. You need to uh, work on more realistic goals that uh, fit your lifestyle. Um, unless, of course, the, your lifestyle requires the Mercedes Benz. Um, now, uh, there's a story uh, which may be apocryphal that uh, Mother Teresa was being interviewed, I, I think, by Barbara Walters. And uh, uh, Barbara Walters asked her, do you pray? And she said, yes, I, I pray. What do you say when you pray? I don't say anything. I listen. And what does, God, what does God do when you pray? What do you listen for? And he says, God doesn't say anything either. He listens. Hmm. And uh, so that's, uh, th th there is a consistency of, uh, of a mixture of creative visualization and meditation that, kind of, that uh, fits into how you should pray. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> no, sir. Uh, I do want to make one correction about the politics and religion remark at the beginning. 
we do have a couple of rules here and maybe I should have reiterated them. Um, and they don't have anything to do with politics and religion. They come from Shrikant's meetup as a whole. Uh, and they are first, be brief. Second, stay on topic. Uh, third is be courteous. And the, oh, the other one is about raising your hand. So well, I got it. That's it. So uh, essentially three in this format, because I ask you to raise your hand in the chat. Uh, be brief, stay on topic, and be courteous. Those are the rules. So, uh, okay, cool. Thanks, Mike. Ritesh, you are up. Hey, so so less uh, less uplifting version of what Mike just said. Um, um, you know, being being a rational atheist, well, most days, right? Uh, I found the notion of sort of the the secret or or ask the universe and it will respond a little bit incre incredulous. But recently, uh, you know, my brain kind of opened up to the notion of self self hypnosis. And uh, I was reading a book called The Power of the Unconscious Mind, which is a very interesting book because he refers to the New Testament throughout the book, but he refers to it as what Mike just said, trained as a way of opening your mind up to the possibility of accomplishing it. And the whole book literally is taking prayer and turning it inwards. And it's all about this notion of reprogramming your subconscious to to enable yourself to achieve your own goals. So it's really turning it inwards from ask the universe and thou shalt receive or how we put it to letting yourself achieve your goals or in a more uh, you know, negative sense, negative formulation, stopping yourself from sabotaging your, yourself. Right? Yeah. And, and that, you know, after hearing so many people talk about you know, affirmations and sort of attraction and so on and so forth and being like, seriously, come on, right? And we've all heard about the, the Dave Chappelle skit about, you know, the, the starving child not wishing for pork chops. And, and, and it's, like, it's like, this can't be true to, well, it's about programming yourself and, and opening up your subconscious to achieving your goals. And I find that uh, somehow more more uh, plausible than uh, I'm going to wish an external entity or the universe or whatever it is to give me my Mercedes Benz, right? Anyway, so that's my my sort of recent uh, revelation, and it's 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 uh, I'm going to try a hypnosis class in the next week or so. Cool. Just see you know where that goes. So that that's that's awesome. That that journey that uh, mirrors my own journey rather uh, closely. I, I'm, I remain, uh, I continually have sort of a disgust response to like the secret and the, the, that sort of new agey type of thing. But um, what I have realized through sort of having people, you know, closely in my life who are very into that is that I, you know, I think that they're, they have their heads on backwards with the mechanism, but often the techniques themselves are actually pretty good. And, you know, even doing things like affirmations and vision boards and, you know, what the things like that, like that's, those are good techniques for, you know, cultivating a successful mindset. And, and like you said, sort of priming your subconscious to let yourself succeed. But yeah, whether the mechanism that they tout is the, the way that it's actually working. Eh, anyway, not, not, not even necessarily the important part of the discussion, but uh, cool. It's All right. On, on this one, one last thing. Sure. It's, I think it's effective when it is part of the work, right? Like when you're actually sitting down and it's not a, a, like it describes here, a begging for wishing something to be different, but it's actually you doing something that's equivalent, like, like meditation is often compared to working out, right? Doing reps, like returning to the breath. It's, it's, it can be difficult and it's hard to keep and it's important to stay consistent and it just trains the mind over time. So I, I think it, it, it's like it's like if we called uh, working out like anything that you were in the gym, not actually doing the work. So 
like a, 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 a begging wish to the universe would be the equivalent of going to the gym and just sitting there and not doing anything, <laughs> you know, and, and, and hoping to, that you, you know, get healthier. Fitness by osmosis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I framed it in my notes is uh, sort of posturing your subconscious, right? So demanding what you want is about being an intentional being and feeding to your subconscious that this is who I am. And it, it connects. I've been reading Scott Barry Kaufman's book, um, Transcend. I finally have time to actually like really absorb it. But, uh, and I want to talk about a little bit of what he talks about in that book about self-esteem, but in particular about the, the sort of begging posture versus the insisting posture. I think the posture of begging for things to be different is disempowering, right? It, it, you're training yourself that you are powerless when you, when you, like he says, go to prayer, like asking for the, the higher power to, you know, take charge and control things and not let the bad stuff happen. And, you know, it, like that's, basically telling yourself, well, I, I can't do it. But when you say, this is what I'm getting out of life. This is what I'm insisting upon. Here's what I'm going to get from it. Here are the reasons I'm going to succeed. That's actually retraining yourself to be more uh, powerful or masterful in that sense. Uh, and that's sort of where I wanted to connect to transcend for a second. If anybody hasn't read this book, I'm not all the way through it, but the way that Scott Barry Kaufman talks about the, uh, he, he essentially builds on Abraham Maslow's ideas about uh, needs and self. And in Transcend, he talks about self-esteem as having these two parts, right? There is the social connection half, which is essentially just having positive social connections with people and the mastery half, which is the evaluation of your overall sense of agency. Are you an intentional being who can bring about your desired goals by exercising your will? And like, to me, that's, that's what this principle is about. It's about shifting your mindset to being that masterful, intentional being, and not necessarily even just to achieve your goals, but also to increase your self-esteem, which has links between there are links between healthy self-esteem and growth and exploration and purpose and creativity. So it's like this feedback loop, uh, the way that I see it. Uh, one more quick quote from Transcend before we move on. He says, the most important attitude we may, uh, the most important attitude we have may be the attitude we have toward ourselves. A basic sense of self-worth and confidence in the effectiveness of our actions provides a fundamental foundation for growth. And so that brings us right back to the principle of confidence in the effectiveness of your actions. That's what insisting upon getting what you want out of life is about. So, yeah. All right. Um, in the chat it says, okay, Shrikant, you're up. Yeah. I want to talk briefly about the Indian approach to prayer. Now, again, I'm not a religious person, but I find that approach to be very different than the Western approach. Uh, in maybe in some ways it is the same, but let, let me describe to you what the, what the approach is. When you're praying, you're basically trying to connect to the deepest part of you. That's all you're trying to do. And you're trying to act from there. And that is immensely powerful. That's like, I mean, in Indian philosophy, the God is in you. So you're basically trying to be God, you know, trying to be yourself. So it is the same idea of Carl Jung, of self. So you're trying to connect to the self. And it's like, if you are there, then from that, you can do anything. You know, it's like, it's, it's a point of tremendous power. And it's not something that you have to beg for because it is yours. You just have forgotten it. You get distracted by all kinds of stuff. It's all yours. It's, it's all in you. You just need to connect to it. And prayer is all about refocusing on, on your core. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, we may have talked about that before. That sounds familiar. But yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting take on sort of the function of prayer. Uh, Follow-up question for you, Shrikant. Do you think that 
functionally, like, you know, I said at the beginning, there are all these sort of systems of, of religion throughout the world, and they all seem to have some, uh, some form of prayer or meditation or, or whatever to them. Do you think that the, the, the function of those things is sort of a similar idea, even though it's framed differently? Uh, or do you think that that's actually providing something completely different to people who practice in that way? Um, I think, you know, religion is as deep as philosophy and different approaches to religion, even within the same religion is very different. So there is a difference, for example, between faith-based and knowledge-based approach to religion. Um, for example, Indian approach is the gnostic approach or knowledge-based approach. So it is about you're trying to know yourself. Whereas many aspects of the Western religions are faith-based. You need to have faith. Um, now, at some point, both of them are the same. In some ways of thinking, both of them amount to the same. So there is just this tremendous variation. So it is uh, difficult for me to answer because, you know, though I try, try to sure. study religions, um, I don't know. The best person who has done work on that is Carl Jung because he has explicitly focused on the commonalities mm. of religion and try to come up with a model of view which is common to all religions. So I think going for the commonness of religions is a very powerful approach because it leaves aside um, all kinds of accidental things or rituals that develop in, a, in, in different individual rel religions and try to say, okay, what is common? And there you might find there is a reason that it is there, it is common. Uh, so you're trying to get at something fundamental about human beings. Thank you. All right, uh, we will take a couple more questions here or comments from the chat. And then I wanna move on to the exercise and the breakout rooms, cause that's where the, the good discussion happens. All right, uh, Ritesh, then Kevin, and then we'll keep going from there. Um, what 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 he said, Chase, and then what Shrikan said. I remember a story, and it's so bizarre, because I, you know, it was a very central story from Tibetan Buddhist um, study, where when you prostrate, there's a prostration practice in Buddhism, and there's a famous story. This famous monk called uh, uh, Chopel, this is a Tibetan monk, and he once had a debate and he said, whom are you prostrating to? And clearly not the Buddha because the, the, the logic goes, if he could help you, he would have helped you by now. And because he hasn't helped you by now means he cannot help you. So that's you know, kind of a proof of the non-omnipotence non of the Buddha. So you, whom are you really prostrating to? And the theology, the central theology is that you're prostrating to your future enlightened self, right? Which very neatly comes comes back to, you know, sort of whom are you asking for help? You're asking yourself for help, and with the with the belief that enlightenment is possible. Right. So if you don't believe it's possible, then you cannot ask the future enlightened self for help. Right? So it's, it's a very interesting exercise in in self belief that yes, I can be enlightened, and then I want to ask that being which is really inside of you in the future for help. <laughs> so it's a very nice sort of circular, you know, brainwashing. Um, uh, but it is, it, is, it is that belief that makes you practice and prostrate. And there's no other power that you can ask for help because if you could, then they would have helped you by now because they're compassionate. And because they haven't means they cannot. That's kind of the logic, how the logic goes. Interesting. That's, that's a you know counterpoint or a a supplementary point to the prayer aspect in in uh, sort of Eastern traditions. Thank you. All right, uh, Kevin. Hey, it's nice to see you back, Chase. Yeah, thank you. Happy New Year. Um, New Year. I got a two part about a beggar and uh, let's see prayer. One is for beggars are uh, tangible. You try to help yourself. That's the same thing. Uh, a food or money, whatever, you know, or your family. The prayer is more spiritual. And for others, you possibly pray for the world, for your, uh, 
uh, even let's see player file next to future itself or reverse kind of thing. That's, you know, kind of commonality. Another about it is that's a good question you pop up, ask uh, Sanka about uh, religious. I would say that's a historical based on uh, demography, let's see from European, Middle East, and uh, Asia, Indian. Um, here, if let's see, assume now we want to fo form another new religions. Now, possibly we name a global city environment, the digital environment. So it would be a bit different. So environmental fact that, that's uh, that's give you some idea, I would say, from the religious perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. All right, next is Sarika Chopra. Okay. Hi, so um, so when I did my undergrad, I studied philosophy and I had this professor, um, Edwin Bryant, who studied Indo Indology. So I, I wanted to look at some of the philosophy that he said. So one of the concepts he explained out of the various schools of Indian philosophical thought was that there were three main types of energy in Hinduism. There is tamas energy, which is very like low vibrational, heavy, maybe really depressed. Then there is like Rajas energy, which is like red, action, passion, like motion oriented. And then at the very top, there's sattvic energy, which is like very light energy. So when you meditate, the goal is to free your mind from like in the most extreme ascetic way, the goal would be to free your mind from wanting anything and to be truly like focused on that higher plane and then if you do that then because when you die and you leave this body because you had attained such a lightness of being the chances that your soul would rise up into the atmosphere and go into space is higher whereas if you had a rajas or thomas life when you die you would be sucked back into the earth realm of the cycle so you want to meditate to free yourself and attain moksha, which is ending the cycle of life. But I was thinking about how this, I mean, that is one of many schools of thought and from this, um, that this teacher taught me about. I was thinking about how, you know, in like Western philosophy, like outwitting the devil and everything, like, you know, well, the things that the devil can like, seduce you into could be like you know all the thomas low energy things and and you do want to keep like a definiteness of purpose and demand what you want from the universe but you know also i think what like the nature of human nature is difficult when you kind of like to truly evaluate the long-term impact of your actions or you know who do you hurt along the way like like my parents don't agree with my ideas, you know, so that can be difficult or um, think, yeah. So I was just, it was just kind of brainstorming and thinking about that, like as I deconstruct my own self and previous behavior and think about where I want, what I'm, what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, how do I kind of, cause I can't be a monk. I'm not going to sit there and do absolutely nothing and starve myself. Like I, you know, I'm part of like human civilization. Yeah. but um that so uh yeah that was that was something i sure maybe another session sure can't that we can do a little on hindu philosophy but um yeah yeah thank you thanks for sharing that all right next it looks like priyanka is not here anymore so jeff hey chase good to see you back hey jeff good to see you too so um uh, like many of us here, I, I have explored this, these questions a lot over the last decades. And um, at this point, I guess I have a, a very high re regard and, and respect for paradox, um, for conflicting statements that both seem um, equally uh, potentially true. Um, you know, from, from predestination to free will, from belief to doubt, from confidence in one's ability and perspectives to humility for the things that I don't know that I don't know, 
for the ability to have a sense of what's going to happen tomorrow and to uh, be open to the possibility that I actually have no idea. Um, that I, I think that that uh, where and where I end up with is um, both the respect for paradox as well as um, in a way sort of seeking to balance these things. So I, I get the, the need to love myself and the need to be able in a healthy way in order to be able to love others in a healthy way. Um, I get to uh, have confidence or belief in a certain purpose for my life and be open and curious as to how that might change um, given other things that happen or that I learn or that I uh, you know, am inspired or exposed to. So that's kind of where I end up. And um, so it is that, 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 you know, respect for paradox and, uh, and seeking balance um, in all things that really uh, has come to make the most sense to me. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. And it looks like that is the end of the questions and uh, hands raised in the chat. So thank you guys for contributing to the conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, Alex, we had discussed before the podcast, we were still debating between uh, a couple of options for the exercise to run through. Uh, did you want to weigh in at all on which one to pick? Um, I, I was thinking the, the one other than the paper tearing. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to present it? But give me one minute. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, all right. Alex is going to, he's going to figure out how to word the exercise that we had come up with. Okay. And then, okay. So I, I think what would be helpful and is helpful for me is to look back at some previous things. So I think a lot of the exercises we've done have been pretty future oriented, assessing goals, thinking about what we want out of life. Um, but I think it might be useful this time to, to look back a little bit and kind of assess, look for something in our lives where this statement may apply. So for me, it, it's gonna reflect more on the, the second part of it, which is demand what you want out of life and um, basically find somewhere where you basically unknowingly drifted um, because of a lack of demanding what you wanted, a, a slow um, you know, deterioration of goals. Mm -hmm. and compare that with a time that that didn't happen, where you stuck to it and try to find the, com like the commonalities and the differences between those two things. And if you wanna to add to that in any way, Chase, go ahead. Yeah, I think the only thing to add to that would be, again, that sort of uh, begging posture versus insisting posture and really, you know, think about your mindset in those moments. Um, yeah. So do you want to try to go through the exercise now or uh, we can also use that as the discussion topic as we go into the breakout rooms? Yeah, let's, let's use it as the discussion topic. All right, cool. So that's the question for the breakout rooms, folks. We are going to head to those shortly. Again, to reiterate, you are comparing two times in your past. One, where you were in more of a begging, drifting posture, powerless posture that caused you to maybe uh, slip from your goals and not achieve what you could have, versus another time where you were empowered and were able to achieve what you wanted and to compare your mindset in those two times. So take some time to think about it uh, and we will discuss those in the breakout rooms and then come back for takeaways. All right, Shrikant. Wonderful, so uh, folks, uh, those are the rules for the breakout rooms to make sure that the breakout rooms are as effective as uh, they can be. And Chase, wonderful to see you back, my friend. Thank you. Uh, starting the breakout rooms now.